Welcome. We're going to be taking a look at the Saltair scenario for No Other Land Without, North Korea in Crisis and Cold War from Compass Games. So to start, we're going to be looking at a board that has a pretty similar setup to our two-player game. Uh, your turn track begins at 1. Uh, both the DPRK and West Reserves begin at 0. Prestige and DPRK will begin at low. Rations will begin at the top of the track. And then Global Opinion will begin in the center. We'll be modifying our event card deck slightly so our song and era deck will remove card number 92 which is defector intel and cards number 28 and 32 and the juche or black deck will be replaced with the optional 28 and optional 32 and the event card names are kissinger visits beijing and red cross meetings once the board's set up we'll deal out a hand of eight cards to both the west and to dprk your West cards should be face down on the table. Uh, you won't examine that hand at all under any circumstances. So those cards will remain on the table. And each turn is going to begin with the West acting until the final turn, in which case you'll consult the West Solitaire decision tree to see whether or not Keichan Internment Camp Legacy Event is in play. If it is, the West will act second that turn only. Um, otherwise, the West will act first, as it has in all the previous turns. So on turn one, the West is going to be acting first. They have initiative. They're going to grab a card, flip it up, and reveal the event. After that, you'll be consulting the Solitaire Decision Tree to see how the West is going to perform with that card. In this case, the event card is a West event. So if we look at our flowchart here, it instructs us, is the card a West event? It is. Would the event have an effect? It would. And then play the event. Easy enough, right? So, in this case, we have Khrushchev's Secret Speech uh, flips the Aid from the Kremlin card to Unavailable. It would shift Global Opinion, which started out in the center, over one space toward the west. After that, we'd proceed to the first DPRK turn. So this is the DPRK hand. They'd be looking over their cards, and they're going to choose to play this card for three points. S mobilization. So instead of using the event effect, they're going to place um, some infrastructure out. So they place in Pyongyang, Kaesong, and Rasong right off the bat. And then place their card in the discard. So for the West's next turn, they're going to reveal another card. So this card is a DPRK event. Uh, as we said before, DPRK events. Um, when played from the west hand, do not automatically trigger the event effect. Instead, the first thing would, we would do is consult the DPRK reserves and see if they have three reserves uh, currently. Right now they do not. So there would be no option for the DPRK player to choose whether or not to trigger this event effect. So the west will just proceed immediately to playing this card for action points. From there we look at the solitaire decision tree. The card isn't a west event. It's also not unassociated. So, as a result, we're going to proceed here to can the West place outages to prevent the DPRK from placing improvements in empty areas outside of Pyongyang with activities? They most certainly can. So let's take a look. Right now we've got improvements in Pyongyang, Kaesong, and Rasong. So there's a lot of areas adjacent that we have to choose from when deciding where we're going to place outage markers. And the value of our current event card here is 2. So we're only going to be able to place two outages regardless. Um, so we're looking at placing outages first among these empty areas in places where it'll cut off the most uh, spaces on the map in terms of adjacency. Now, you can be counting beyond those spaces. So for example, um, placing an outage here in North Hangway, like in this space, there isn't any further adjacency being cut off because everything outside of that region is still for the most part accessible um, by the DPRK player. Conversely though, King Wan here, if there was an outage marker placed in that space, now this tourist region can no longer be accessed because it's cutting off that portion of the map. Similarly, by placing an outage marker here in North Hamyong, you're cutting off all the areas beyond that space from adjacency. 
So this one is actually cutting off two potential spaces. Kangwon's cutting off one potential space. And South Pyongan has the potential to cut off even more of the map. So we have a lot of good candidates for where we might want to place these markers. But it looks right now like South Pyongan would be the space that would cut off the most regions of the map, followed then by North Hamyo. If determining the number of areas is too hard or uh, feels subjective, or even if there's a tie between two regions in terms of what seems like the most effective play, then proceed to the second item in that box, which is lowest numbered areas according to the map on the right, which is our priority map on page 19. So from there, we'd be looking at the number assigned to each of those regions, right? So if we couldn't tell between these three regions what was cutting off the most adjacency, but we have two AP to spend on outages, then we would place one in three and one in number four region because those are the lowest number regions. And 10 and 11 would be left alone because they're considered lesser priority. So that's the ranking when determining where outage markers are going to go. Let's say our outage markers have been placed on the board and there was no longer any adjacency to consider. We've essentially got the DPRK infrastructure contained. So on a west turn, we would be spending points on the next item down, right? Because there are no um, empty areas outside of Pyongyang that we need to cut off. So we'd follow the no line. And now we get to, can the West advance a defector a minimum of one space on the defector map? The answer is no, because there are no established defector routes on said map. So then we proceed to the next item, which is, can the West establish defector routes? They certainly can. So they have two points to spend, and we establish routes by the priority here. Uh, the first priority is blue routes. So because there are no routes currently out on the map, we'd be able to place them for one point each. And the routes are going to go on the little boxes that have the arrows indicating the direction. These are the paths that you cross. These solid color spaces on the defector map are where the defector is going to travel. So we establish those two routes. Um, as you look, the, the other priority um, items are to Mongolia if global opinion favors the West. Currently, global opinion does favor the West. So next turn, if we were going to be establishing routes, we would take that opportunity to build a route leading to Ulaanbaatar and also filling in this space so that way the defector can advance. As long as global opinion is favoring the West, they like that um, uh, establishing that route through Mongolia because it improves the odds that defectors will survive the trip. Um, going through the Gobi Desert. So the next uh, established routes priority is toward and through Thailand. That is the safer route that they'll take if global opinion doesn't currently favor the West. And the final one is bypassing Thailand if um, placing a marker in this space is prevented by an event. Uh, there's an event that is essentially a border closing in Thailand that goes on the Enduring Events track in the Songhan era. So if that event's out, then they will establish these routes going around Thailand. Otherwise, they will not. And if we've gone through the entire flowchart and we still have action points to spend, then we will invest those points in the West Reserves. If for whatever reason you get to the bottom of the flowchart, there are points left on your card and the West Reserves are full, then the excess points are lost. After a couple turns, the West decision tree should be pretty intuitive. And as a player, you'll be able to anticipate more and more what the West will be doing during its action rounds. However, there's going to be some other concerns, guiding principles and whatnot, that will impact how the West triggers its own events or um, event text. Uh, so for example, when a West event indicates that infrastructure improvements are to be removed from the map, the West is always going to remove the highest level improvements first. If there's a tie between two areas, they'll first select to remove the highest level improvement from an area with an outage marker. Then if they 
if neither of the areas has an outage marker, then they would choose the area that has the lowest number on the priority map. That would have the ranking priority. So in the case of removing a single infrastructure improvement, um, North Pyongan and South Hamyong have a third level uh, infrastructure improvement in each of these areas. Well, we can only remove one. Neither area has an outage marker. So then we look at the priority map, and by consulting that, we see that South Hamyong has a number five, and North Pyongan is given number nine. So five is lower. That is our priority. So we would remove that improvement from the map. Additionally, when conducting defect activities, the West is going to select a citizen to defect that is not adjacent to elites, if possible or available, and they will try to select citizens that are adjacent to active dissidents if they are there. So in this case, very straightforward, there's an active dissident here, so they'll want to select this citizen first because it isn't adjacent to an elite, but it is adjacent to a dissident. If that citizen was not available, say it was already a marked defector, now they'll be choosing an area that just simply does not have an elite marked. If, say, the only space is available right now for them to select a female citizen that's eligible for defection is adjacent to an elite, they'll pick either one of these because both of them are adjacent to an active dissident as well. So these two spaces actually counteract each other. However, if we were in a situation like this, now there's a choice of two citizens to defect. One of them is adjacent to a dissident and an elite, and the other one's just adjacent to the elite. They will opt to select this one for their first effect action. When an event instructs you to eliminate an elite, uh, the West is going to eliminate the elite that's adjacent to the most unmarked female citizens on the map, on the generation map, before eliminating any others. The West events that shift global opinion are counted as a beneficial effect. So when you're following the West decision tree on um, page 19, make sure that you are triggering West events that even if the only impact they're going to have is shifting global opinion in favor of the West, that should be happening. You should be doing that as much as possible. If the global opinion track is currently in um, this space or one beyond, the West is going to be able to pass once per turn during the action phase. The West will only ever use its pass when they have one card remaining in hand. So if they have one card left in the West hand and they are able to pass, they will take that opportunity to pass. So that should give you a pretty good overview of what the guiding principles are uh, when acting as the West. I think that those guiding principles are, that will develop with time as you're triggering event effects, but it won't come quite as fast as learning the flowchart for the West activities each turn. Um, if you want to modify the difficulty of a given game uh, as you become more accustomed to solitaire, you can make it less challenging um, by beginning play with three reserves in the DPRK, just to make sure that the first event isn't something that's automatically unavailable to you if it's a DPRK event. And additionally, there are cards that can be added to the song and deck and removed to help kind of benefit the DPRK player as you learn the ropes. Um, but I think generally speaking, this is a really good way for even players who prefer the two-player game but just want to learn how the game works, see some of the event cards, become a little bit more familiar with the mechanics of the game. It is different. Uh, but at the same time, I think it gives you an opportunity to get used to the deck, uh, both the Songin and the Juche decks, uh, without having to lose to another player. So that's uh, always nice. If you have any questions, feel free to post your questions on the BGG uh, forums or on the Consum World Forum, and I'd be more than happy to respond to any of those questions as they come up. Uh, but hopefully you'll be able to make the most out of the decision tree and our, uh, the included materials within the rulebook. Enjoy!